Let's go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, if we could. 1 Corinthians chapter number 7. Well, tonight I'm going to be starting a new series I mentioned this morning called The Phases of Life. And our lives go through various phases, don't they? They go, uh, we have childhood, we have the teenage years, if you will. Uh, we have the single life. We have married life. We have the, the parenting years. And then there's the grandparenting years. And there's a lot of different things that take place in each of those phases. And I think uh, the, there's a lot of blessings in each phase. As along, along with it, there are challenges. They kind of offset each other, I think, in, in some regards. Now, my goal through this series is to help us get a perspective of what God expects of us through each phase of our lives that we pass through so that we can fulfill our responsibilities to the Lord and see good fruit that comes out of each phase. And we want good fruit coming out. There's opportunities with each phase to do something great for God. And uh, we don't want to bemoan the phase that we're in. We want to enjoy it and be used. And I think that's so important as people tonight, we, we consider that. I believe each message will have something practical regardless of the phase you find yourself in. Sometimes people, well, that's just not, it's not my phase, so I'm just not going to be part of that. Well, it doesn't speak well of your maturity spiritually if that's the case, okay? There's always something that we can get out of God's Word regardless of what we're talking about. And that is, so, that is something very critical to understand, that there are practical things that regardless of the phase you find yourself in, there are principles that tend to be universal through all, well, we get a lot of insight about God uh, from each of the phases we're going to talk about. Because there's lots of things you learn about God through the different phases that we, that we travel through. And God's going to teach you things. I, I know in parenting, uh, I've learned a lot about what it means to be a father. I didn't, you know, I, I've learned a lot about how God is a father through this time period. And, uh, and, you know, when we were first married, I've learned a lot about patience. I've had to be very patient. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Get, she's in my wife here. But uh, she's had to learn a lot of patience, trust me, on the other end. But, I mean, there's just different things you learn about God's character and who he is uh, through each step. So, I mean, there's something for you, regardless if you're a grandparent, regardless if you're a child, regardless if you're married or single or whatever the case might be. So, so please consider that tonight. Don't, don't think, well, I'm going to just check out because that's just not my phase. Uh, you're going to miss some things that God has for you. And, and I don't want you to do that. Because God wants us to learn some things through each phase about himself that will bolster our relationship with him. I'm going to start this series by beginning with the single life. And you say, well, why don't you start with childhood or the teenage years? Well, we're going to actually cover those a little bit more under the parenting section because there's a lot of crossover that takes place there. But these years, the single years, if you will, are to be very, or can be very productive for the Lord. It's a great opportunity really to serve God. Or they can be miserable. And for some people, they're miserable in their single life. It's because of what they're choosing to focus on instead of taking the advantage of the opportunity that God has for them. Here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 7, there's a lot about marriage in here, but there's a lot about the single life also mentioned as well. We're going to skip around to a few different verses, uh, so hang on and just uh, read with me here. It says in verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself. This is Paul writing, and Paul was single. He was single. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. Look at verse 24. Skip ahead there. It says, Brethren, let every man wherein he is called therein abide with God. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man uh, so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now look at verse 32. But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. 
But he that is married carries for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is a difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Tonight we're going to be looking at this subject I've simply entitled The Single Life and the blessings that there are and the things that we can do during this time period. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer first. Father, I pray tonight that you would guide us through this time of study. I believe it will be practical in a lot of ways. And even for parents who one day will be parenting or will have single people, as children, I think there will be some helpful things as well. Lord, we just pray you would guide now our study through this series, that you would get the glory out of it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when God originally created the human race, of course, he started with a man, Adam, and a woman, Eve, and brought them together in what we would call marriage today. Now, the institution of marriage has gone through, a ringer, has gone through the ringer over the course of human history in various forms. But did you know that today, that in the scriptures, not everyone was married? Not everyone was married in the scriptures. There were people who were single their whole life and were tremendous people of God. Left their mark on human history. Were used mightily. Of course, I think the most obvious one is the Apostle Paul. He mentions in verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself. I mean, he was, the, he was, a, he was a, a bachelor. He was a proud bachelor, <laughs> based on what you read here. He, he had no problem. He's like, I, I wish everyone was like me, single. Now, there's question, based on his uh, past, when he was Saul of Tarsus, one of those, ri- that, the rising star amongst the religious Hebrews at the time, um, his position would have probably required him to have gotten married. Now, the Bible makes no indication that he ever did or, or that maybe his spouse maybe left him or she died or whatever the case might be, but there is no indication whatsoever that he was ever married. And, of course, he says here, uh, uh, even though tradition may, have, uh, may, uh, may say otherwise, but he says here, I, I, I wish that even as I myself. I say, therefore, in verse 8, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Again, as a single man. Now, there was another very famous individual who was single. His name was Jesus Christ. (laughs) He never married, obviously. But then there's other characters of the Bible. There was Daniel. Daniel lived into his 90s and was never married. Of course, he wrote the book of Daniel and had a tremendous ministry in two world empires and uh, gave us some very deep, insightful things into Bible prophecy. There were, at the time of Daniel, also the three Hebrew children, as they're often referred to. Uh, their, their Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. As far as we know, they were never married. Then there's another interesting character that was never officially married. His name was Samson. Remember him? He was on the verge until... <laughs> Until that last day of his wedding feast and everything blew apart. But he never got married. He had a problem with women. We, we understand that based on the, on the text. But he was somebody that had never gotten married. The twelve disciples. There is no mention except for Peter. We learn that he had a mother-in-law. So he had a wife. Other than that, there is really, unless somebody can bring that to my attention... But there is no indication that the other disciples were married, or what would become the apostles. In the Old Testament, there was a judge, a female judge, by the name of Deborah. It does not appear that she was married. And there's probably others, too, that aren't coming to my mind right now. But the point I want to make is that the single life can be fulfilling if one's focus is correct. And these people I mentioned had a proper focus. Samson got his focus straightened out eventually. But the rest of them, their focus was correct. It wasn't an empty life for them. 
They were used in, in powerful ways. Now, now, some would think that the single life, that's empty. One in which a person is to be depressed until they find that special someone. To me, that's a miserable way to live. And, and one that you're setting yourself up for a major, major disappointment later on. Because there are tremendous advantages of being single. Now, there are tremendous advantages of being married, too. But there are people tonight on both sides of the fence that long for the opposite side. Do you realize that tonight? I'll guarantee you, and I know some of these people, personally, I guarantee you there are people who are married that wish they weren't today. They really do wish. They, they, they do not like the marriage that they're in. And they are, they even in some cases, claim to be born-again Christians. And I'll guarantee you, I know people today that they do not like their single life. <laughs> but look at verse 27. What does Paul tell us? Art thou bound unto a wife or a spouse? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? In other words, are you single? Seek not a wife. What it is is a matter of contentment, of the stage or phase of life that we are sitting in at this moment in time. But I'll guarantee you there are, there are people on both sides of the fence. They're wishing they were loosed from their spouse, and there are some that they're, they're just desperate to find one to be hooked up to. And that's really... Uh, it's really a problematic position for both people to be in. You do not want to find yourself like that because you are finding yourself in a position in which you are going to be miserable. Now we'll get to the marriage part later in the series. Tonight I'm focusing on the single life because it is the stage that there are several of you that find yourself in right at this moment in time and and several parents you're going to actually be parenting in not so long of a future. It's amazing how fast our kids are growing up, aren't they? And they will be there before you know it. In fact, some of you have already gotten there <laughs> um, since I've been here. It's hard to believe that. It's just all the time has flown. Now, most people will get married. Most probably will. I don't know what the percentage is, but I would say it's, it's pretty good. Now, there are some people, though, who are content not being married. There's just, I'm fine. The Apostle Paul was one of them, evidently based on what he, was, he wrote down. Jesus even mentioned that that would be the case for some people. If you go to Matthew chapter 9, hold your place here in 1 Corinthians 7, Matthew 19, excuse me. Matthew chapter 19, Jesus even mentioned that there would be people born that just really don't seem to have much of a desire to be married or they choose to live celibate because of their desire to, do, to devote their time to God. Look at chapter 19 of Matthew and verse 10. His disciples say unto him, If the case of the man be so with his wife, it is not good to marry. In other words, the reason why they're talking about that is because Jesus was reinforcing the fact that he believed in the permanence of marriage. <laughs> but verse 11, he said, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. For there are some eunuchs which were so born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He that is able to receive it, let him receive it. In other words, everyone has a different, different mentality on it. Some are born that way, some uh, by force, like Daniel was in his case. And then some have chosen that, that pathway, like Paul. Now, if that is not you, <laughs> you're like, no, I'm, I'm not, I don't fall into any of those categories, then I'm guessing that God has someone for you at some point in your life. Again, verse 7 of our text, back in 1 Corinthians 7, it says, For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God. In other words, everyone falls into a certain category, one after this manner and one and another after that. 
Verse 9, but, or excuse me, verse 8, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. In other words, you know, if, if they don't have that calling, if you will, or they haven't committed themselves like that, and, and, and there's the desire there, I'm, he's like, no, it's, it's fine. They, and most likely, we'll get married at some point. My desire in exploring this subject is so that we can get an understanding of what God wants us to do in that period of time of our lives. What God is maybe even trying to do in that period of time of our lives so as we can prepare properly and be ready for that next phase, which, of course, we would call marriage. The thing about each phase is that it builds upon the previous phase. Okay? The things you learn in childhood will impact your teenage years. The things you learn in your teenage years will impact your single life. The things that you are learning and preparing for in your single life will eventually affect your marriage and, of course, they'll go on to parenting and grandparenting. I guess grandparenting, uh, <laughs> you're at the top of the game there. You graduate eventually into eternity. But you have to remember, each phase builds upon the previous phase. And there are things that God is no doubt going to teach you during the single life era that are going to be necessary for you to have a marriage that brings God glory and honor. And, it, and it's something that you can actually enjoy and not something you're going to eventually hate because there are enough people today hating their marriages, and it, and it creates so many issues. When you start talking about children, and you start talking about the future, and part of it is because of the way they handled their single life, and the way they went about trying to choose a spouse. You know, and a lot of people get themselves in trouble. Tonight our goal is to alleviate that so that you can be on the precipice of something good. So tonight, let's begin considering some thoughts to make the single life as fruitful and enjoyable and successful, if you will, as possible. First off, let's talk about the goal. <laughs> the goal. There's a goal in the single life. I think there's a goal that's going to transcend all phases of life, but we're, again, appropriating this to the single life. God's goal for all of us is that we become the people God wants us to be. Is that we become the people God wants us to be. And he kind of lays it out very clearly in Romans 8, 29. We're familiar with this. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay? that we become the people God wants us to be, and this is what God wants us to be, just like Jesus. In the way we think, we act, and we talk. That's what God wants. Character development. That's what we're talking about here. Character development. And it's God's top priority within every one of us. Character is our ability to choose right and reject wrong. And to do so without a hiccup. <laughs> the greater our character, the greater of a person we can be. Because who we are, our character, affects what we do ultimately. Okay? And God wants us to do right based on his definition of right, of course. Now, the world has a whole different, different definition of right. <laughs> What's interesting is that a lot of the things they call right, God calls wrong. Go figure, right? It's the devil's domain. And uh, he, is the, he is the major influencer. So we want, what we're talking about is being able to make the right decision based on God's right definition, or definition of what is right. Now, there's another term in the Bible commonly used to describe this process we're talking about. It's the word sanctification. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 3 through 4, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye would, should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Verse 4 is really what I'm driving at. That we know how to possess our bodies, our lives, in sanctification and honor. In other words, we do the honorable thing based on what God says is honorable and right. 
That's what he's trying to produce in our lives. And everything we go through in this life is part of that process if we're saved tonight. Now, sanctification is defined as the act of making one holy, or again, like Jesus. Because right character is holy living. Okay? What or who can prevent that from taking place in our lives? Do you have any idea? Who could stop that? Is there something that could stop that? Actually not. The only one that can stop that process or hinder it is ourselves. Realize that tonight? We're the ones that can hinder that process. Nobody, nothing, can keep us from achieving that goal except ourselves. Based on the decisions that we make and the responsiveness we have when God speaks to us and wants to change us and puts us through things. Now, we can cooperate with the process, and I really want to encourage everybody here, and even myself, to cooperate with that process the best that you can. Because the other thing is we can fight it. But I have found and continue to learn that you can't beat God. And you can't fight God. And you can try to manipulate the situation as much as you want. If God's merciful, he'll, he'll stop you. Or sometimes he lets you go on with what, you do, what you're trying to do just to teach you a lesson. I mean, this is serious stuff, folks, because God's very, very serious about this. Before God can use us for anything, character must be developed within us. It must be. We can cooperate with it, or we can fight it, but it's going to happen because God can't use us in the way he desires until our character reaches certain levels. Nor can he bless us with certain things either, if there's some character lacking. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verses 20 through 21. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and earth. This house is speaking of our lives. In other words, there's some good things in our lives, but there's also some things that are not so good. And some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, the things that are dishonorable, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Again, God's trying to move the bad stuff out of our lives and replace it with good. Now, we all have some good stuff in there, but there are some not-so-good stuff based on a variety of different things. The greatest thing you, as a single person, can do is do your part in becoming the person God wants you to be. Do your part in becoming the person you want to be. As a single person, you are in a position that is unique in your life. You're not under mom and dad's roof anymore. So you're not necessarily beholden to them in the sense of as you were as a child or as a teen. You have, you have freedom. You, you are now in the position where you are making your own choices. And you don't have, at this point, the responsibilities of a married person that begin to compound as you have children. And then as you get older, the grandparent stage, that usually has uh, other issues, particularly when you're speaking of health and, and stuff like that. And, of course, having, a, uh, having an influence on, on those uh, other generations underneath them. See, as a single person, you, can, you have some choices and some opportunities that the day you get married will no longer exist. And once you have kids, they really won't exist. <laughs> That's just reality. Now, there are blessings that come with those. You kind of exchange out for some things, but there are some things you lose. But the choice comes down to, in your single life, what am I going to live for? Am I going to live for myself? Or am I going to seek to... Or am I going to seek to grow spiritually? Because this is the time where you have the, 
the best amount of time you'll ever have. Because you're not without your distractions and responsibilities are probably the least you'll have outside of your jobs. Because later on, there's greater distractions and greater responsibilities that come with the, addition, with the, with the, the upcoming phases. And this is the time you can really put a lot of effort into developing your, or, or going along and learning what God wants you to be. And discovering God's will for your life. What direction God would have you to go and to grow. 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. And, and tonight, as a single person, and I'm not trying to target you guys, <laughs> forgive me. I'll target the married people later. I'll target husbands. I'll target wives. Don't worry. So you just get the brunt of it tonight. So forgive me. But how much have you devoted to growing in grace? How much time have you devoted to that? I want to encourage you to devote as much as you can. This is your great time to do that. And this is especially true tonight if you were a single person saved, you know, saved as a single person. I was one of those people. I got saved when I was 20. And I had some learning to do. Still learning, of course, but... But I think of... <clears throat> What I thought when I first got saved to when I finally got married, I suppose about five years later. And really how much I didn't know even at that point. <laughs> but I'm saying, especially if you were saved a little, I'll, I'll call it in your single years, you've got some things to learn about God. And there may be some things that need to be moved out of your life that will be essential for you to be the spouse that God would want you to be. You know, as a single person, again, commit yourself to learning and applying the truths that will enable you to be the person God wants you to be. It's true of all phases, but the single life, you have a really unique time. You know, I, I remember... When I was single, and there was a number of our single, we had a number of singles at the time. I think I wouldn't be surprised there were 15, 20 of us. I think if that sounds right. But you know, we had we we had friends, but you know, it was a very active group. Very active group. I I mean, we stayed busy. You know, I remember a lot of them were involved in the campus ministry at the time. You know, they were going to Bible studies a lot of nights. They were serving, they were doing, they were devoting a lot of time towards the things of God and learning. We'll talk a little bit about serving in another message, but, but the people really strove to, to be the people that God wanted them to be. And, and, I, and I value that time period because it, it, set, a, it set a framework for me or, or a foundation that I've been able to build upon. Now, it might be a little different if you, if you were raised in a, in a good Christian home. I understand not all Christian homes are all that great. But if you were raised in a good one, you can build upon what you had already had there. You're actually further ahead in some regards, or hopefully you are. But this is the time, really, to, to learn those things and devote yourself and your focus on God. As we see, secondly... And don't worry, I only have two points tonight. Whew. This won't last another hour, but that's okay. <laughs> the gateway. Say, so how do I become the person God wants me to be? How do I do that? Well, I will say this. It starts, of course, by making your relationship with God your top priority. Your number one top priority. You know, Micah 6, 8, we've seen this verse before. He has showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. 
Make your relationship with God your top priority. See, God needs to become your first love. Your first love. If you go back to Matthew chapter number 22, Jesus was asked a question. You know, what is the greatest commandment of them all? And in Matthew 22, he responds to that question. We'll start in verse 36. Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. According to this, and other verses, of course, the Lord is to be your first love. Your first love. Because our love for God, our relationship with God, is the gateway to all great relationships with other people. You realize that tonight? Your relationship with God will be a barometer of your relationships with other people. If your relationship with God stinks, I'll guarantee you, your relationship with other people is going to stink too. Because you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you don't have God loving you, are you knowing how much God loves you? Our relationship with God is the gateway to all great relationships with other people. Again, regardless of the phase we're talking about, this relationship must be top priority. And it's good before you get involved with anybody that this is something that is settled and a deep-rooted conviction within your life. Okay? If we're hit and miss with God, you know, we're faithful for a little while, but kind of off sorts the next, faithful for a little while, off sorts the next, you are unstable. Say, so that's tough, Pastor. I know, but I'm trying to help you tonight. You're unstable. God wants you to be stable. And that relationship with God is the thing that will stabilize your life. It, it truly will. Of course, the relationship starts the day we get saved. I talked about that this morning. The day we, we trust Christ, we, we turn from our sin and repentance, trust Him in faith and are born again. And I, I expounded that in detail this morning. That's where the relationship starts with God. But afterwards, it grows as we choose to spend time communicating with God. Relationships are, are built on communication. And communication is not just a one-way street. It's just not us talking up to the sky. But it's us speaking and listening to what God has to tell us. Because communication is a two-way street. We're talking with God and He's talking to us. Communication is one of the keys to building trust in human relationships. You know, businesses spend a lot of money shuttling people all over the country, all over the world to build relationships, don't they? Some of you have been involved in some of that. Why? Because Face-to-face -face communication tells, you know, kind of brokers the deal, doesn't it? The buyer wants to know if they can trust the seller. And with a relationship, the buyer is more confident to purchase what the seller is selling. Okay? It's true in every human relationship. Well, how do we know if we can trust somebody? By what is communicated back and forth. Right? Communication is one of the major keys in building trust in human relationships. And, of course, it's the same with our relationship with God. Our faith builds as we get to know God. Better through the communication process, of course, of prayer and time in God's Word. And as the relationship matures, it'll bring security, stability, and sanctification into a person's life. 
we'll learn how to get our needs, particularly our emotional needs, met by God himself, which is critical to, again, having security, which means living without fear. Stability, which means having a sound mind that can make rational decisions instead of an emotionally controlled mind that makes irrational decisions. Does whatever feels like at the moment, which always leads you to bad decisions. <laughs> and a sanctified life, which is a holy life. The biggest thing our relationship with God brings us, of course, is the knowledge that we are loved, which is the cornerstone of everything of the Christian life is knowing that God loves us. As we know that God loves us, we respond to it. It's a natural thing. And we also reflect that love back to other people. Only then you can love another. You have to remember, your future spouse is the closest neighbor you'll ever have. Think about that for just a little bit, all right? I mean, it clicks, I I would hope. Your future spouse is the closest neighbor you'll ever have. They're side by side with you in life. And the Bible says here that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But I'll guarantee you here today, there are marriages where they are not loving each other. They're at each other's throats. That'll never happen to me because I'm going to find Mr. Right or Mrs. Right and and they're going to be just perfect. Good luck with that one. That is yet to be found. Okay? You can't love your spouse until you know you're in love with God. Otherwise, you'll be looking for love in all the other places. Many people who are single struggle with this, especially if they came from a home life that love wasn't expressed well. Hence, they struggle with a lot of insecurity about themselves and the way they think others perceive them. And they want that need for love to be met, so they believe, as the world proclaims, they have to find that perfect, special someone to meet that need. I mean, that's what all the movies say. I mean, there are industries here today where that, that have built empires of millions and billions of dollars communicating this message. We call it the love story. I guess the new term is rom-com, right? <laughs> as cute as they are, they, they, they tend to paint a kind of a distorted view on life, or can be. That there's that perfect someone out there to meet that need. And sometimes, and a lot of times, they, they find someone. Oh, this is, this is the one. I remember when I was a teenager or, early, or just out of college, and there was a friend of mine. I, I heard this phrase go, go off, especially after we had graduated high school, and, and, and people saying, is this the one? Is this the one? Is this the one? It was always kind of, we'll see what happens. And sometimes it was the one, and sometimes it just, it was not the one. (laughs) Let's just put it that way. I'm talking about amongst the unsaved people I knew. And this person, at least at first, seems to meet the needs. Oh, they, they spend so much attention on me. They spend money on me. They spend time with me. They and so forth. And eventually they, they get married. And they're so in love, and, and you try to say, you know what, there's going to come a point in time where that feeling that you feel right now is going to go away. Oh, that's impossible. That'll never, ever, not us. Right. Not us. I'll guarantee you, every married person here tonight will say, that, that, that official honeymoon phase fades. And it takes work. And I'm not saying a, in a bad way. And it can grow into something better. But that initial infatuation usually stops. Usually people, they, they go from you know, the highlight, and then all of a sudden there's a, there's a phase of time where they begin to wonder, what did I marry? I never did, but 
<laughs> I had to save my skin there. <laughs> no. But I mean, I mean, seriously, they begin to wonder, you know, he leaves his socks on the floor. The sink's a mess. Her food does not taste like mom's. You just go down the line. And all the married people are looking at me, smiling. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> well, that will never happen to us. Guess what? You know what I find, too, is that oftentimes married people marry people that are kind of opposite of them. Not in every area, but in a lot of areas. You know, he or she's an extrovert, he or she's an introvert. That tends to happen. Are, are they have, they have some, some areas of life that they're polar opposite in. That during the courtship phase, that, oh yeah, that was fine. But all of a sudden, all that stuff is gone, the bells and whistles, and, and we're getting into regular life, and all of a sudden, that stuff starts annoying you. <laughs> and you have to choose to love that person. The feeling doesn't drive it anymore, like it did. And love becomes a choice. And as you make choices that are right, good things come out of that. But that, that can happen. And, and the sad thing is, though, is that there are people that get disillusioned with the person that they, they married. Because that person fails to meet that need like they did. And the flaws of that person that that they married come into full view. It becomes real. It's like, oh man. Because you learn a lot more when you start living with that person. Now some, as a result of that, will go on to live, well, miserable marriages. Many in our day are getting divorced. And that only compounds the problem. If you want to put yourself, single person, on a precipice for a good marriage, it starts now with you drawing closer to God and doing your part to build that relationship with Him. Become convinced of the fact that God loves you so that you can be a reflection of that love towards your future spouse. If a single person, or any person that matter, neglects this, but talking about single people tonight, I guarantee you it will come out in their relationship with your future spouse. It will. It will come out in your future relationship with your spouse and can create problems. Can create some problems for us. And May I hasten to say nobody's going to be perfect on this, okay? So don't get like, oh, I've got to be perfect. No, I'm not talking about perfection. But I am saying you should be striving and growing in the right direction. Not constantly starting and stopping in your, you know, spiritual life. There are some people today that their, their spiritual life is like a jerk. They go for it and then they jerk back and they jerk to the side and so forth. You know, they're up and down all around spiritually. Can I say tonight... That's because of your own choice. The things that you're choosing to do and the emotional decisions that you're making over spiritual decisions. But if you can get yourself a, a, where you're focused on God, striving to do right, and uh, it's not like you're never going to fail. And I, I hope you don't misunderstand that. But I'm saying here tonight, if you want to put yourself on a good precipice for a good marriage, start right now getting your relationship with God and allow it to be rock solid as best as you know how. God doesn't expect perfection, but he does expect you going in the right direction and some stability in your life. It's so important. You know, it may even be in God's mercy if we are that shaky to God to hold off a little bit until he gives, until we get to that point. 
See, the single life is one of the prime times in life you are not locked down by responsibilities of future phases, and time is available for you to really put effort into this relationship development with God. Again, can I encourage you tonight, if this is your phase, and for everybody, regardless of what phase you're at, make God your first love. Saturate yourself with His presence. Learn how much He truly loves you and provide the love you need. I believe single people here tonight, I believe you want a spouse that loves God. I believe you do. You wouldn't be here probably tonight if that's not what you wanted. Well, you be in love with God then too. You be in love with God then too. With God's help, be like the person you want to marry. Think about that for just a little bit. With God's help, you be the person that you want to marry. I'm speaking of godliness and character and that kind of stuff. Allow God to conform you into the image that he, that he wants you to be. I've noticed that people in love with God will seek people who are in love with God. They will. I've yet to see two people drawn together where one loved God and the other did not. It just doesn't work that way. Nor do I believe God will allow somebody who's in love with him to go with somebody that's not in love with him. And guess what? That's a choice every person here tonight has the power to make. Each one of us has the ability to be in love with God. I'll never forget a statement. I've used it before. I heard a preacher. He's with the Lord now. I've been with the Lord for a number of years. I went to Israel with him for the first time almost 20 years ago now, 19, 20 years ago. He would come up to Fargo and preach periodically. But he said, you know, you're as close to God as you want to be right now. You and I, as individuals, are as close to God as we want to be right now. If we want to be close to Him, you're making efforts to try to be close to Him. If God isn't all that important other than maybe showing up on you know, some services, it shows. It'll show in your life. We're as close to Him as we want to be right now. And if it's lacking, guess what? God didn't move. We did. Why? Because the Bible says here in Jude 1, verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep yourselves in the love of God. We have a responsibility to draw nearer to God and fall in love with Him. Draw nigh to God, and He will what? Draw nigh to you. This is, a, this is a real important thing for the single person. It will help you stay content, by the way, as you wait. Everyone waits different amounts of time. Sometimes it is for character development. Sometimes it's because God's got a mission for that person. There's various reasons, and I'm not going to sit here and judge anybody for whatever reason. They're in whatever phase they're at right now. But my point is, if you're in this phase, make God the love of your life. Give, him, give yourself over to Him. And learn how much He loves you. Because if you get that rock solid, you'll be a dynamo spouse. Because you won't go into marriage looking to get your needs met. You'll be going into marriage looking to meet the need of another. And that kind of that and that's how a good marriage works. Each spouse trying to bless and meet the need of the other instead of the other way around. Each spouse trying to get their needs met by the other 
Usually that's where the conflict starts. That's selfishness. But if you can learn and be happy and content without a spouse, and God's loving you and you're loving Him, when He brings that one, it'll just be all the sweeter. Again, the single life can be something that is very blessed and used of God, but it's got to start here. I'll bring another message next time just to shore up a few other things I want to address in this, in this phase at least. Maybe I'll do two or whatever. I'll see. I want to make sure I get out what I want to speak on in, in regards to this phase at least. But I want to encourage you. There's a, use this time in your life to do something for God and to fall in love with Him. It'll be it'll 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 again put you in a position to be the best spouse that you can be. And that is a good position to be for the glory of God. Let's stand to our feet tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed.